good morning and welcome to Brewster Baptist Church. My name is Pastor David Pranga. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And I'm so glad that you're here. And you're alive. And you're awake. And I'm glad that those people that are tuning in today are here, as well as people in the sanctuary, that you made it a priority to be here today. Now, how many of you guys remember, there was a TV show about five, ten years ago called Ex Extreme Makeover Home Edition. See, that premise of the show, if you remember this show, is that there was usually a family that was in great need or faced a hardship, and then they would look at their house, and the house was like falling apart. There was flaws to this house. The family um, was just making things functional. Um, there was projects that were left undone. And usually the houses were just too small for the family. And then they would interview this, um, this family. And then basically what would happen is they would send this family on a trip for one week to like Florida or somewhere really cool. And then what would happen is the community would come together. They would bring carpenters. They would bring electricians plumbers, interior decorators, and they would fix the house. And they would make it look beautiful and functional. And what we all lived for was like the last five minutes. The last five minutes is like the family comes back, the community is waiting outside the house, there's a big, like a semi, and they bring the semi away, and then the kids and the parents, they were just like, oh my goodness, look at that house. And they walk in the house, and they're in tears because they just love it. And as you're watching this, transformation is taking place, and it's just cool to see that everything is coming together, and everything looks beautiful, and you're just astonished by it. And it was just like one of these cool shows, and I always liked it. But when I look at my own life, I can often see the ugliness the ugliness of my behaviors, the ugliness of my actions that I'm not really proud of. In fact, there are times in my life where I will say something and I'm like, I wish I could have those words back. There's sometimes where I do things and I'm like, why did I do that? And I kind of regret that, my actions. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like that I need this extreme Christian makeover. But the good news is, is that we have God, and he is full of doing makeovers, not only in my life, but also in the life of you. And you. See, when we come to follow Jesus, Jesus receives, we receive like the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in our heart, and it transforms our heart to be more like Christ. And just like those homes that sometimes there are walls that just need to be torn down for like, for, to make the house look beautiful, sometimes our hearts and our minds need to go through a transformation and a makeover. So let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever thought about what God wants Christ followers to be known for? Have you ever thought about that? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn your Bibles open to the book of Ephesians. Now, Pastor Doug, he shared about chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians. I'm going to just summarize it. He shared that God had a vision and a mission for the church. And Paul shared, um, or Doug shared, about God's love and grace and mercy and power. And we see that God had this great desire of tearing down the walls between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. And having the believers come together to form one body, one family, and one church. And they were united with love. And then we move on to chapter 4. And what we see through chapter 4, 5, and 6 is simply the practical sense of how this is done on a day-by-day -day basis. How do we live daily with each other in love and unity. And we pick this up in chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. It says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in their fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to hardening of their hearts. 
having lost insensitivity. They have given themselves over the, to the sensuality and to the indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So what is Paul, when he writes this letter, what does he say? He is, he's basically saying, you are to no longer live like the Gentiles do, meaning that you can no longer live like the people around you. You need to be different than those people. And as Christ followers, we are to be different. We should have a different focus and a different mission than the people in our world or in our society. See, as Christ followers, who are we to follow? Let me ask this one more time. I know we had a time change. But as Christ followers, who are we to follow? Jesus, not the world. I want you to picture Paul, because Paul is writing this letter, but we have to think about Paul. He's a mentor. He's a pastor to these early Christians. And there's just this small handful of Christians that are living in Ephesus. And Paul loves them. But he cares about their behavior. He cares about how they act towards each other. And Paul remembers them because he spent a considerable amount of time raising up these house churches. See, Paul also understood the context when he wrote this letter. See, Ephesus was a large metropolitan area. 300,000 people lived there in the first century, which we would consider Turkey. It was the center of all kinds of pagan worship, Greek and Roman gods. And he knew the temptations of the Ephesians were facing because the society was so vastly different than what Paul was calling them to live. See, Paul had lived with them. He had cared about them. He had loved them. And when Paul went away, he didn't forget about them. Eighteen months go by, and he writes this letter to them. And he talks about it. And what he talks about is he t wants to tell them, don't forget about what I've taught you. To be like Christ, to keep your focus on him, not the way of the world. Because the way of the world are like pagans. Their thinking is futile. It will lead to destruction. But keep your eyes upon Jesus, and he will lead you in the right ways. And we move on from this to... Verses 20 through 24. He says, That, however, is not the way of life you learn. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupt by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of the minds, to put on your new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. See, for Paul, Christianity was not a bunch of facts about Jesus. It wasn't about memorizing what you should or shouldn't do. For Paul, it was remembering the example of Jesus and then living it out. It meant to be what it meant to be walking with Jesus. And what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? It means that your life is going to be different. You're going to be focused on different things than the people around you or about society values. So if we go back to the text, it says, Paul uses these words, he says, to put off your old self. See, an extreme makeover, the old, the old walls... They needed to be knocked down, and a new layout had to be transformed to take its place. And just like those homes, our heart and our mind needed to get rid of those sinful habits and attitudes. They need to be knocked down and discarded so that God can begin a new life in you. But unfortunately, Paul knew these Ephesians. And he writes this letter and he reminds them. And he actually kind of like calls them out because he loves them. See, these Ephesians were known to have struggles. They were known 
for lying, for their anger, for stealing, for talking rudely about each other. And Paul reminds them that their behaviors and their actions should be different than the people around them. This small group of Christ followers were in desperate need of a makeover. The question that we have this morning is, how should their life be different? How should our life be different? We pick it up in Ephesians 4.25. It says, therefore, each of you must put off your falsehoods and speak truthfully to your neighbors. For we are all members of one body. So how should we be different? We tell the truth. That's how we're different. See, God created a church for one body with many different people groups. The early church was very diverse in its backgrounds. But speaking truth was especially important because when we speak truth, what happens? We form trust. We form community. And relationships grow closer to each other when we practice talking about truth. But what happens when we lie to each other? Trust is broken and damaged. And it can be hard to build back that trust. But what Paul was encouraging the believers is to be different than the people around you. And he wanted to encourage the church. And to encourage us is to be truthful. But what happens in our sinful nature? It's easy for us to lie to each other, to put the blame on someone else instead of ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to lie to a person to protect their feelings. Sometimes we lie because the story sounds so much better when we add a lot more details to it. And sometimes we lie because we want to make ourselves the hero more than what we should have been. See, we all know that telling the truth can be difficult. Sometimes telling the truth isn't pleasant. Sometimes telling the truth causes conflict. And sometimes hearing the truth from someone else is hard to handle. See, unfortunately, we lie. When we lie, we break trust. And it's so important in relationships. And when we lie to each other, we actually are giving the devil a foothold into our heart. And we don't want to do that. See, these lies are not only hurtful to our friends and our family, but it's also hurtful to God. It displeases him greatly. But the good news is this, that God can forgive us when we lie. There are times where we need to go back to God and say, God, can you forgive me for lying? And God grants us the forgiveness that we need and that is awesome. But there are times where we probably need to go back to a family member or a friend and ask them for forgiveness. Because what God cares most about is us to repair those relationships, those broken relationships God cares about. See, when we tell the truth, we honor God. And I know there are times by telling the truth can be difficult. But we need to offer what? Grace and mercy when we have a tough conversation with someone. We may even need to start the conversation with saying, you know what? I love you. But I have to tell you this because it's just something I feel like you need to know. See, we all know that we're not perfect. We all know that. But a real friend wants to come alongside us and grow us in our relationship with God and with each other. And when we speak truth, we're honoring God. So that's one of the ways which we need to be different. And we move on to verse 26. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. And do not give a devil a foothold. How should we be different? We don't stay angry at each other. Okay? Did Jesus get angry? 
yes. Okay? We see in the Gospels, Jesus got angry at the temple. He overturned tables. But Jesus had this righteous anger. And I can't speak about you, but when my anger is not righteous at all, okay? Can't speak about you guys, but it's the wrong type of anger. When the world gets angry, what usually happens? They carry what? Grudges, okay? And what is a grudge when you hear someone say, well, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. And that's not healthy. The second thing that people do is that sometimes when they get angry, they let it fester in their heart. And they just bury it. And let me say, that's unhealthy as well. As Christ followers, Paul is saying is, don't let the sun go down on you Why you're still angry. What Paul is saying is, we are not to stay angry with each other. We need to work out our problems. We shouldn't let it fester inside of us. And I was thinking of an example of this. You know, even in my own household... And I'm just going to pick on myself, and I'm going to pick on my wife. But sometimes we will get in an argument with each other. And we'll get pretty upset with each other. And sometimes we are feeling like the other person's not listening or hearing with what we're having to say. And the temperature rises. I don't know if that's in your household, but sometimes in mine it does. But how do we handle it? Sometimes we need to take a step back and say, you know what? I think we need to take some time alone. And I'll go to a different room, and she'll go to the different room. And it gives us time to, what, think about it. Time apart is helpful. It settles down our emotions. We can start thinking clearly about things. We can even reflect on the conversation and say, oh, man, I, she's not understanding me, and I need to say it in a different way. Sometimes it allows us time to, what, pray about it, right? That's probably the first thing we should do. Not always the thing I go to do. But what will usually happen is one of us will come back to the other and say, can we talk about that conversation again? And of course we say yes. And sometimes Christy and I will say, you know what? I was wrong. I am sorry. I overreact. Most of the time, we just have to come back together and we have to work through the situation with clearer minds. And more, just willing to work it out. See, the key thing is, is that we don't stay angry at each other. See, as Christ followers, we need to talk through these situations. We can't let our anger fester. We shouldn't hold grudges. We need to resolve the issues the best we can. See, as Christ followers, we will all become angry. But we don't want to stay there. And that is how we're different than the world. We move on to verse 28. It says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. How are we to be different? We don't steal. We work. And with what we work, We share with others. See, the Apostle Paul, he knew this early group of believers. He knew that some of them had a problem with stealing. And he just says, don't be part of the problem anymore. Don't steal. But work. Find a job. Do something useful with your hands. And that sounds like pretty good advice, right? We like that advice because most of us don't struggle with stealing. But it's the second part of that verse. Paul shares an important thought. He says, what Christ followers should do is that they should share with what they have. So you work to share with others that are in need. See, Christ followers are to be generous people. They are to be generous with what they have to help those that are in need, to give to others that are struggling. When I think about Brewster Baptist Church, two things come to my mind right away that we do a very good job at. The first one is the food pantry. We have the Brewster Food Pantry right here where we help out our community. And many of you guys bring food in during the week or on Sundays to help with our food pantry. That's one of those ways that it's an easy way to be generous with what God has given us. A second way that 
I see this in our, is our ministry called the Deacon Fund. Many of you guys have, know about this, but you know, as, as we take our offering, once a month we take money for our Deacon Fund. And you put in the offering, you can just put in the memo called Deacon Fund, and we give money to people that are going through rough times. I mean, we have all gone through rough times at one time or another. And some of our are blessed. And so we've helped people out. And last year, we took in over $40,000 to help people that were struggling. People that had car repairs that were out of luck. People that needed their utility bills paid for. People that had rent that needed to be paid for. Camp scholarships. And this is the wonderful thing about our church. This verse reminds us that we are to be different, that we are supposed to be generous, and that we are supposed to share with the, with the resources that God has given us. We are to be generous people. That's another difference. We move on to verse 29. Verse 29 is a tough one. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. How are we to be different? We are to build others up when we speak. See, when I was in college, this was actually the first verse I learned to memorize. I won't tell you why. Maybe you'll figure it out. But it was something I needed to work on. When I think of the word unwholesome talk, what comes to your mind? Words that cause harm or decay. Words that put people down. Words that are hurtful. Words that may be degrading to others. How many of you guys remember the uh, little um, thing called sticks and stones may, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Anybody remember those sayings? Yeah. I don't know why we were taught that. I don't know about you, but... Words and unwholesome talk, they stay with you for a long, long time. Way longer than people realize. Because words can be harmful and they live in our mind forever. I think we can all think back to our childhood or somebody said something to us that was hurtful. It might be a family member. It might have been a teacher or a coach. It might have been a classmate. But those words hurt. And they stay in our memory, and we don't forget it. And over time, they could spring back up again. I think back to when I was in elementary school, and I struggled with reading, and more specifically, with the pronunciation of words. And I can remember the kids laughing and giggling and teasing me because I struggled with words. Years go by. But those memories never fade. I never forget it. See, teasing words, harsh words, they stay with us. Words are powerful. And I believe many of us have had hurtful words that have stayed with you as well. And when I read this verse again, I want us to focus on the second part of this verse. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And it may benefit those who listen. See, our focus needs to be on building others up when we talk with them. We need to be positive. We need to find good things to say to people. We should have a community that talks nicely and encouraging each other and being helpful to each other. We should point out the, the helpful things that when people come alongside us and we say, you know what, thank you for helping me in my walk with the Lord. We should be people that are thankful. And that's another way in which we're different. But here's the key verse. This is the key verse for today. Verse 32, how we can be different. He says, be kind, should be underlined compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us 
and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How are we to be different? We're to tell the truth. We don't stay angry. We don't steal. But we work and we share with others. We build others up when we speak. And we are to be kind, compassionate, forgiving, and loving people. Do you know any kind people here today? Do you know any compassionate people? Do you know any forgiving people? Do you know any loving people? See, those are the people that God wants us to be. That is the mission of the church. See, what Paul wanted was the church to be special. He wanted the church to be known in the community because they were full of kindness and that they were compassionate. Paul wanted to see a place where people forgave each other and they practiced what it means to love each other. See, that's what makes the church special. That would be a church that where outsiders looked in and said, you know what, there's people that have it going on. I want to be part of that church. I want to be part of those people because those people are nice. And that's what Christ followers should be known for. Shouldn't they be known for that? I think so. But when I look at that list, I see the ways that I fall short in so many of those areas. And I know that I have work to be done because I said before, and I say again, that I'm in need of an extreme Christian makeover. How are you doing on that list? How are you doing? But let me tell you the good news. There's some good news in this. We all fall short of God's expectations. And God just wants us to confess our sins to him. And when we confess our sins, God will forgive us. God will give us a fresh start. And God will begin to do a makeover and a work in our heart and in our mind and in our life. We just have to go to him and confess. So this morning, I ask you to join with me for this unison prayer. It's taken from the book of Common Prayer. And if this applies to you, please recite it with me. If it doesn't apply to you, that's okay. It's okay. You just don't need as much help as I do. So let's say this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against your thought, word, and deeds by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may have delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.